If there is such a thing as the most representative movie star of the 20th century, the winner, without argument, would be Marilyn Monroe. From her illegitimate birth, to an absent father, a mentally unstable mother, childhood molestation, and a rushed teenage marriage to a man she had nothing in common with, to her gradual rise to a level of fame that is rarely known in this world, her life story is cinematic in every way. Marilyn appeared in 18 movies before she became a star in her own right, playing a variety of roles. Films like Love Happy with the Marx Brothers, the multi-academy award-winning All About Eve, the moody and suggestive The Asphalt Jungle, and Fritz Lang's engaging Clash by Night should be sought out, but honestly, most of the others would be forgotten if she hadn't appeared in them. That leaves 12 films that were completed while Marilyn Monroe was the number one movie star of her era. Everyone knows her image, but how many people have actually watched her films? Are they worth seeking out? Do any of them speak to a contemporary audience? Which ones are the best? I'll answer all of those questions and more as we work our way from number 12, a film I personally hate, to number one, a true classic of the 20th century cinema of the Marilyn Monroe filmography. From 1957, this film launched Monroe's own production company, which was supposed to save her from the typecasting and denigration she received at the hands of the studio. Not only did Marilyn snag a play that worked beautifully for Vivian Lee in London's West End, she also scored by having Lee's ex, Oscar-winning critics darling Laurence Olivier sign on as co-star and director. History says Monroe and Olivier hated one another, and while it's true there is zero chemistry between the actors, it's also true that the script by Terence Radigan was the real issue. This story of a sweet but dumb chorus girl who catches a Carpathian nobleman's eye and is then invited to the nobleman's house for a planned seduction that goes terribly wrong is glacially paced, unoriginal, and completely lacking in humor. The resulting movie may have turned a profit based on the contemporary appeal of the leads and the excellent and committed supporting cast, but the truth is, it's a leisurely, laugh-free bore and recommended only for the most ardent and patient of fans. Now, say to me what you said to me this morning. Well, if I do, you will only laugh at me again and say my epaulets are scratching you or something and I shall be disconcerted again. Take the risk. Released in 1961, a year before her death, and featuring the most respected artists of the day, including Thelma Ritter, Eli Wallach, Estelle Getty, Montgomery Clift, and Clark Gable, under the direction of John Huston, this turd disappoints on every level. The script, written by one of the greatest playwrights of the 20th century and Monroe's husband at the time, Arthur Miller, is a vague reinvention of the old man in the sea that casts Gable as the ancient fisherman and wild mustangs in Nevada as the fish. Gable's character, unironically named Gay, puts together a motley crew of horse wranglers for a final pointless roundup while also romancing an insecure divorcee played by Monroe. You'd think having one of the planet's most celebrated playwrights create a role for his superstar wife would lead to something fascinating, but this is one of the worst of many bad scripts Monroe would have to bring to life. She is forced to play yet another generally neurotic but vulnerable character in a lackluster film that manages to waste a dream cast in a story that goes nowhere. Monroe was savaged by the critics upon the film's release because the mainstream pundits didn't want to blame their literary god Miller for a project that lived or died on his unproven ability to write an entertaining screenplay. This film could have used far more Thelma Ritter and way less Arthur Miller. Recommended only for those viewers who have great patience and a supernatural ability to stay awake. What makes you so sad? I think you're the saddest girl I ever met. First man never said that. Take two stars of equal intensity, talent, and outsider appeal, cast them in a Western adventure filmed in majestic Banff and Jasper National Parks in Alberta, Canada, and you'll have an instant hit. Well, no. 
Monroe herself referred to it as her worst film. At the time, she was in the thrall of her Machiavellian acting coach, Natasha Lytes, whom she was also rumored to have a deeply codependent lesbian relationship with, and her portrayal of dance hall Chanteuse K is one of the least interesting in her admittedly limited repertoire. While this script about a widowed father coming to pick up his son after a stint in prison for shooting a man in the back to save a friend is no work of genius, the failure in this case lies on the shoulders of director Otto Preminger and his two main actors. To degrade the project further, Preminger's so-called action sequences are amateurish and laughable in every way. And while Monroe and Mitchum seem like a dream pairing, the truth is they exhibit little interest in one another or the film they're both starring in. The supporting cast, including Rory Calhoun and Tommy Reddick, do all the heavy lifting. The film's one saving grace is the artificiality of Monroe's sex goddess persona superimposed over the beauty of some of Canada's greatest natural features. While there is conflict in this juxtaposition, there is also a harmony that often verges on the erotic as two distinct kinds of primal beauty both compete and blend in a uniquely 20th century pop culture way. Check it out, but keep your expectations low. One thing about you, though. You get somebody in trouble, you get right in it with them. Only trouble should get you somewhere. Never gets me anything. Fox Studios' first attempt at giving Marilyn a larger role in a movie is a low-budget effort known more for the personalities it introduced than the brilliance of its filmmaking. The film also stars Richard Widmark in one of his early hard-boiled roles, and a young Anne Bancroft as a cabaret singer who offers little to the story beyond three tiresome songs in the first 30 minutes. The always interesting Elisha Cook Jr. plays Marilyn's well-meaning uncle. This is Marilyn's first dramatic role after an apprenticeship of playing mostly sex pots and girlfriends, and no one, including her, is all that comfortable with the change in character. She plays a manipulative, mentally unwell babysitter who ends up menacing the child she's responsible for, and finally, through crisis, bringing Widmark and Bancroft back together again for the final reel. As is almost always the case, the fault lies with the turgid script more than with Monroe's acting abilities, and the entire enterprise feels like one of those projects where everyone involved went on to much better things. Don't Bother to Knock wants to be a psychological thriller without being all that psychological or all that thrilling. While this film may prove attractive to Monroe aficionados and completists, it will leave pretty much everyone else cold. You know, you're a gal with a lot of variations. If you go, then none of it can be true. None of what? Half the time, I don't know what you're talking about. None of anything. I haven't had earrings on for three years. Director George Cukor is remembered for the amazing, often Oscar-nominated performances he could get out of headstrong and difficult actresses. If only he'd been able to do the same thing for Monroe in the second-to-last film she would ever make. Again, she is saddled with a light and unlikely script in which Yves Montand, who was a matinee idol of the day, competes for Marilyn's affections with Frankie Vaughn, who was a forgotten pop star of the day, while Tony Randall plays the usual gay best friend part he would play for his entire career. The story, which concerns a playboy billionaire who falls in love with a bohemian young actress who hates billionaires, already stretches credulity to its breaking point. It is riddled with farcical tropes of mistaken identity and unlikely coincidences that are meant to be ridiculous and charming, but that consistently fall flat. Its failure is Monroe's alone. Her characterization and delivery are weak. Her face, like her body, is slack and unfocused. Even Jack Cole's choreography, which is so sharp and fresh in most of her films, is hackneyed and trite in Let's Make Love. It must also be said that Marilyn's struggles with alcohol and amphetamine addiction, as well as mental illness, were well known by this time. The only reason this film isn't lower on the list is because of Montan's performance, which manages to be charmingly self-deprecating. Monroe and Cukor are both at their worst, which is sad. 
although not as sad as their only other collaboration, her final unfinished film, Something's Got to Give. Because now that I know you, for instance, the United Nations or uh, the State Department, they could use you, I bet, or some big business where you deal with people from all over. I have a way about you, you know. This follow-up to the mega-hit Gentlemen Prefer Blondes is Monroe's first cinemascope picture, a super widescreen format that was the IMAX of its day, and casts her with two other sex goddesses from an earlier generation. The leonine Lauren Bacall, who matched wits with Bogart in a series of classic films and in real life, and Betty Grable, World War II's most popular pinup gal, whose shapely gams were insured for a million dollars, play Monroe's friends. They are three predatory female models seeking gullible rich males to trade sex for matrimony with, each of whom comes to realize money can't buy love. The plot is antiquated, but enjoyable when accepted for what it is. Marilyn takes on one of her funniest parts as the nearsighted Pola, and her physical comedy is inspired. The press hoped for some sort of insecure diva behavior between the three stars, but they all behaved professionally. At its worst, How to Marry a Millionaire is a shallow parade of seductive women and images of the day. At its best, it's a liberated buddy pick that doesn't quite live up to its potential. Don't you wear glasses? Oh, dear me, no. Whatever gives you that idea? You've got the most peculiar vision I ever saw. Why do you say that? Because you're reading that book upside down. This movie is just one in an endless mid-20th century parade of scripts by and about nebbish, unattractive men who use art to construct a reality that makes them irresistible to much younger, more attractive women. Of course, in reality, none of these young women would have anything to do with these losers. The supposedly comic and self-effacing Tom Ewell plays a tired husband who meets a beautiful girl in the apartment upstairs while his wife and son are on a summer holiday. Marilyn plays the nameless girl upstairs, a TV model with a winning personality and a killer body. The rest of the script consists of Ewell's character being torn between his lust for the girl and his devotion to his family. The film has plenty of fantasy sequences and a whole lot of leering sexual innuendo with exactly zero action. The film was a huge hit, and the making of it supposedly ended Monroe's marriage to Joe DiMaggio, who was so enraged by the repeated takes required to get the scene where Monroe's dress is famously blown into the air by the New York subway system. Today, the film is remembered predominantly for this very scene and little else. However, Marilyn is so good in it, so iconic in that character she embodies, and so fresh, this film ends up much higher on the list than its lame-ass script and supporting cast deserve. How would you like to come down here and have a drink with me? Maybe. Hmm? Why, thanks. I'd love it. You would? Sure, it'd be fun. Let me just go put something on. I'll go into the kitchen and get dressed. The kitchen? Yes, when it's hot like this. You know what I do? I keep my undies in the icebox. I know this one is going to cause some to scratch their heads. It can be argued that There's No Business Like Show Business isn't even a Marilyn Monroe movie, and that argument would not be without merit. But here's the thing. This film isn't anybody else's story, either. While the movie features some of the greatest musical theatre performers of the day, including Ethel Merman, Dan Daly, Donald O'Connor, Mitzi Gaynor, and Frankie Ray, none of those personalities are the star of the film. If there is a star, it's the infectious and brilliant music of composer Irving Berlin, which is featured in the film's eye-popping musical numbers. Merman and Daly are the die-hard, the show-must-go-on troopers, while their offspring range from bubbly but uncomplicated daughter Gaynor, gay codified as a priest eldest son Ray, and the much-troubled because he's so damn talented baby boy O'Connor. As the kids grow up and the country goes to war, there are few surprises in this narrative, but the story is told with enough efficiency and charm for the viewer to enjoy the trip. 
If there's anything notable about this film concerning Monroe, it's that after having top billing in a string of money-making hits, she plays an important but relatively minor part in the family story. Nonetheless, while her performances in her three musical numbers were widely panned at the time, they hold up very well today. A front of warm air is moving in from... Where? Jamaica. Moderately high barometric pressure will cover the uh, northeast and Where? the deep south. Niagara. The first movie to give Marilyn star billing is a frustrating movie both for its successes and its failures. Marilyn plays the unfaithful, dissatisfied wife of war survivor and PTSD sufferer Joseph Cotton in a film that actually stars the winsome Jean Peters and some forgotten actor who plays her schmuck husband. This film has a structural, whose movie is this anyway problem from the first frame. As Peters and Schmuck Husband attempt to enjoy a honeymoon-slash-business trip, they are pulled into the dangerous world of the unhinged Cotton and his femme fatale wife. Marilyn's character has a hotter, less complicated young man on the side she's planning to run away with after they get rid of Cotton. Unfortunately, their plan, which isn't all that great to begin with, does not work out as expected, and a clever reversal of expectation gives Marilyn one of the best scenes in the movie when she expects to identify the body of her hapless husband, but sees her lover instead. Cotton has survived the plan, and exacts his revenge on Monroe in a stylish murder sequence in the fall's famous Carillon. Once she's gone, the film degenerates into a contrived battle for survival on a boat that is fighting not to go over Niagara Falls, which makes it sound a lot more exciting than it actually is. What's important about Niagara is that this is the only time in her career when Monroe will be allowed to play a character that is truly dangerous. Marilyn's Rose has no trace of the smart, dumb blonde she will perfect in her other films. This woman knows where her power lies and intends to exploit it fully while she's got it and Monroe has never looked more luscious. I suspect when male studio execs and directors saw the film, they were terrified by her potential power and worked even harder to ensure she continued to play only the benign characters she'd be known for and come to hate. Mrs. Loomis, do you identify this body as that of your husband, George Loomis? In the Josh Logan-directed Bus Stop, Monroe plays Cherie, a cynical dance hall girl shaking her ass for drinks and tips in a Phoenix honky-tonk. She is accosted by a cowboy who falls in love with her at first sight and basically makes her life miserable until she has no choice but to break his heart. Don Murray plays the stalkerish cowboy, and it's a credit to his beauty and ability to inspire empathy that he is able to make the character someone the audience eventually sides with. Murray is one of the few leading men Marilyn would have whose sexual power rivaled her own, and their chemistry together is truly potent. Luckily, the script takes a step beyond the usual sexist trash by making Murray's character's obsessiveness an issue that nearly sinks any possibility of a relationship. It's not until he's emasculated by having the spit beat out of him that he can become vulnerable enough for Monroe's character to love. This is the film that finally convinced Marilyn's horrible, sexist critics that she could truly act. It is her finest performance in any film. Say goodbye forever. Cherry, wait a second. Cherry, wait a second. Cherry! <laughs> Our number two film in this list is based on a story by legendary writer Anita Luce. The story concerns canny gold digger Lorelai Lee and her best friend, the fast-talking, no-nonsense Dorothy Malone, played by the commanding Jane Russell. Marilyn is the chorus girl fiancé of a wealthy young man, and she and Dorothy plan to take a tour of Europe before the marriage. But the fiancé's father has pegged Lorelai as a gold digger and sends a private detective to follow the women, where a series of misunderstandings lead to Lorelai being compromised and the engagement broken off. 
Luckily, the girls are quickly headlining in a Paris club as the mystery of a supposedly stolen tiara plays out in a convoluted and hysterical manner. Eventually, Lorelai and Dorothy put things right, and there's a happy ending with a double wedding. While director Howard Hawks is more known for his male-oriented films, he's also known for his work with actresses, and he guides the complimentary Monroe and Russell through their paces expertly. Jack Cole's clever choreography has made many of the musical numbers camp classics, and the glossy cinematography keeps the eye happy as the silliness unfolds. This is Marilyn's best musical, and one of her most iconic performances. A kiss may be grand, but it won't pay the rental on your humble flat, or help you at the automat. This was Marilyn's second film with director Billy Wilder, and he rarely has anything good to say about working with her. During filming, her marriage to playwright Arthur Miller was breaking down. She had a miscarriage, attempted suicide, and drove director, co-stars, and crew crazy with her tardiness and lack of professionalism. Thankfully, not a moment of this turmoil is visible on the screen. When Tony Curtis and Jack Lemmon, playing a couple of itinerant musicians, witness a mob massacre, they are forced to disguise themselves as women and join an all-girls band in order to get the next train out of town. While on the train, they meet the scattered but lovable Sugar, who is one of Marilyn's most vulnerable and ethereal characters, and Curtis falls for her. The band ends up at a Floridian resort where the farcical plot goes crazy, with a millionaire falling for Lemon in drag, while Curtis adopts yet another character in order to convince Sugar he is a rich man and win her heart. When the suspicious gangsters show up, the film speeds to its harrowing and hilarious conclusion as all of the deceptions and misunderstandings are revealed and smartly resolved. This is one of those rare films you can watch repeatedly and it never gets stale. It showcases not just Marilyn's best work, but the best of everyone else involved. There's a reason many critics refer to this as one of the top ten screen comedies of all time. Marilyn Monroe died in August of 1962 of what was called an accidental drug overdose, but the truth of her demise is still very much speculated on, even today. What is undeniable is that her tragic life, unique talent, and stellar career made her one of the most recognizable faces to ever grace a movie screen. She is every bit as famous and popular today as she was 60 years ago. As for the movies she left behind... There's no denying many of them are garbage, but she does have one excellent drama, one excellent musical, and one excellent comedy, and that's something many stars who lived far longer than she did can never claim. Her legacy is profound, and her influence is undeniable. She will be remembered forever as the greatest and most tragic movie star of the 20th century. <laughs>